I'd like to sing this song together and just sing it just in worship. I will worship you, mighty God.
Jesus.
started with this promise. High noon, you're from the old, the west, the wild west. What did high noon usually stand for? A gunfight. You read the history of the west. A lot of people didn't want to be in a shadow, so they would uh, go out at high noon so the sun wouldn't be in anybody's eyes and you could look at the eyes of your opponent and you were up for a fight. Well, do you know that before the West happened and was eventually won, high noon was a biblical time. Not only midday noon, but midnight. 12 o'clock is the title of the message, and we're getting close to 12 o'clock midnight. In the time and calendar of the Lord our God, which we are involved in, whether we comprehend it or not, we're living in the final hours of man, at least for the church. There will be a little more time for those who are not a part of the body of Christ that will go through the great tribulation. And then there will be a thousand years where the righteous will rule and reign with Christ after the uh, battle of Armageddon and judgment comes upon the earth, Christ will come back to the new heaven and new earth and there will be a thousand years of reigning with the Lord. And uh, we won't get into all that. I want you to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture in the book of Psalms 91. Psalm 91. And we want to we'll read the first six verses. We're going to focus our attention uh, for the sake of the message on verse 6. Psalm 91, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read this morning from the NIV, New International Version. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High 
will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. Verse 6. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday, 12 o'clock noon. So he's dealing not only with the issues of the night, but the issues of the day. The psalmist here is declaring the greatness of God in that he is faithful, someone that you and I can trust, a place where we can find shelter, a place where we can receive rest, a place where we can be hidden and protected by God. Under his feathers and wings, we have a place of safety and refuge. He declares his faithfulness and that he is our shield and our rampart. Therefore, we do not need to be afraid at midnight nor at noonday nor any other hour. But the focus of the message is based upon the thought of 12 o'clock, high noon, which speaks not only biblically, and we'll, we'll explore a little bit of that today, but being that we are here in the West, we identify with a lot of the historical uh, gunfights and things that happen. Uh, we're, we're real close to... Uh, uh, the O.K. Corral and Tombstone, which was famous for a lot of gunfighting and deaths, uh, people confronting one another. How many have felt at least once or twice in the last year confronted? Either by the stress of life or the, the news or... I, after all these months, I still get out of my vehicle and, and sometimes have to find myself going back to the vehicle and getting my mask. My wife has uh, figured out how to uh, handle that. She just pulls it down when she's not using it and then pulls it up. She's always got it on. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm just not at that place yet. <laughs> it pulls on my ears too much. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, confrontation. How many love confrontation? Come on, I'll be honest. Uh, because there are some people that just go out seeking it. They feel like they are called of God to confront. Some of you mothers. <laughs> maybe some fathers. Maybe some children. Siblings. Siblings love to confront. Students think that teachers love to confront. I have no idea where parishioners, people who attend church, got the idea that pastors like to confront. There may be some that do, but I, I do not like confrontation. Don't like to do it. Don't like to receive it. But the story of con con confrontation begins in Genesis probably one of the most significant confrontations that took place, took place in the day and we, we look at it, if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 2 read it here out of the King James. It 
chapter 2 and verse 15, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The Good News Bible says to care for the garden and to guard it. How many remembered reading that? that there was two things that God gave Adam responsibility to do at creation after he had created Adam. And he said, I want you to go in, and he, some of the things was to name the animals, but he said, I want you to care for, tend the garden, and to guard it. Now keep that in your mind as we, as we go forward. Most believers would say that they have a healthy relationship with God. How many would feel you have a, healthy relationship with God. But today I want to look at and try to understand how what we perceive as a healthy relationship with God in that we, we do trust God. We do love God. We know God loves us. We believe in his word. And that would begin to build a healthy relationship biblically and spiritually but how circumstances and sometimes one individual can come in and affect what was a healthy relationship and cause that relationship with God to be undermined or compromised. Uh, Psalm 91 that we read together identifies the fact that there are epidemics that strike at noon and at night. As we look at it this morning, I want us to meditate on the part of the verse that speaks about terrible sufferings that come at noon. And uh, we are in biblical prophecy, the what would be considered the midnight hour, somewhere between 11 and midnight. Midnight would be what we would consider the coming of the Lord for the church and the beginning of the great tribulation and the judgment of God dealing with those who have rejected him. If we look at this present pandemic that we're in, COVID-19, we're cautioned not to venture out of our homes unless absolutely necessary. And the reason for this is because there are those who exhibit no symptoms of the COVID virus, and yet they are contagious. We are finding that there are far more people that have the virus that have no symptoms than there are that have it with symptoms. That's scary. How many would like to know that you are sick because you feel it? But if you don't know you're sick and you go on and you extend your strength and you spend time with your family and go and be with everybody and yet you have a sickness that could make others sick or kill them, I would rather know so that I can draw back. How many would say yes to that? But do you know that most of us today do not realize that we've been compromised? How many are somewhat shocked at what's happening in our nation today? In one week, President Biden has signed over 40 executive orders that historically would have been decided by Congress. In one week, he's signed 40 executive orders that would normally have needed a vote of Congress to have been effective. And the pace and the direction that he has taken our nation to me is startling. It's not that I didn't know his position and political persuasion. I'm just amazed that in one week he has rushed us in a direction that biblically 
should we be involved in it, says that there is no hope for those people and no hope for that nation. How many understand that? That biblically, the direction we are being taken, the Bible said, should we participate in that and pursue it and follow it and be a part of it, there would be no hope for us and no hope for our nation. So it's not only startling, it's fearful. If you're a person of faith, uh, your antennas ought to be up and you ought to be spending more time in prayer than you have been. Amen. Uh, the reason that we need to be cautious, not only with this virus that is around us and with other things that are happening in our world that are dangerous, but with the spiritual climate of our nation and our world. The reason that we need to be cautious is that there are those who exhibit no symptom of evil. Their conversation does not identify that they are intent on destroying. And the reason that they may not say it or identify it is that many of them don't even realize that they're on that track. They've been duped by the enemy. They've been deceived. The Bible calls it in the last days that there will be multitudes who literally give themselves over to believe something that's not true. They believe it's true, but it's not. They gave themselves over to believe a lie and the Bible says that the end of that is damnation, destruction. These individuals are spiritually asymptomatic. They do not show necessarily the face or the tenor or the temperament of evil and destruction and yet they are contagious. There's a high probability that they will infect many people around them because of their position and their influence. We look at some healthy relationships in the Bible this morning that God had established and one of the first ones that we looked at in Genesis is that God came in the cool of the day and he developed a relationship with Adam and he and Adam communed and fellowship and in that time Adam began to grow, he began to name the animals, he began to learn responsibility in the garden but there's one thing that we, we see that develops very quickly uh, after God creates Eve in looking at Adam and saying it's not good for man to be alone. Uh, Eve comes into the picture. They become husband and wife, eventually produce children, and therefore the beginning of the human race. But in the very beginning of that, here comes an individual, a serpent, who's actually walking on legs. He climbs up in the tree and he speaks to Eve. She is an asymptomatic individual. Adam, not so much, but since he has now a life partner, he has become an individual who is not just affected by God, but is affected by Eve. Now, I want you to take notice of that, and this is not a male-female husband-wife situation. This is just the fact that when someone else becomes involved in your life, they will have an effect upon your life. How many have learned that? Pastor Jordan and Jessica are learning that now that Jack has arrived, he has more persuasive power as a baby who doesn't even know what's going on on their lives than they do. Now we look at that and say, well, that's just having a baby. That's innocent. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet the danger is that should parents cave in to the clock and the appetite and the physical adjustments that the child goes through without taking position of caring for and guarding the future, 
Are you listening to me? Should they let the baby dictate when they're going to eat, when they're going to sleep, which means they won't get much? They will end up having the baby be awake at night and sleep through the day. And if they have a job, they're going to have to get up exhausted and go to a job because something innocent, something precious, asymptomatic, you wouldn't look at a baby and say there's any danger here. But if the parent does not guard the responsibility that they have as a parent to care for, to train, to teach, to provide, and to guide them so that they mature and understand how to deal with life, that baby will destroy the health and the future of the parent innocently. There was no intention, but innocently it will happen. And the parents will get sick and be unable to go to work because what's happening with the baby. Now that's very innocent and precious. But that same intention is what the enemy of our souls uses. When he comes in, he comes in innocently. Doesn't demand, doesn't try to take over, just creates a question, a concern. Do you see what I see? And because you haven't been thinking evil and deception and fraud, you won't even see it coming. I mean, Kale said to me, Pastor, I would do anything for you. I said, please don't, do, don't say that. Please have the attitude that you would do anything for God. But question, question everyone else. If God speaks to you and it can be confirmed by the word, you don't need any other affirmation. But the Bible says there is a covering and a counsel that all of us should seek. First God, second scripture, and then the counsel of godly people. We should not make decisions based upon our understanding. We'll find ourselves deceived and in trouble. You could say amen to that or owe me. If you look at what happens as a result of what the seemed to be innocent, him talking to Eve and Eve responding, uh, if you look at the conversation, we're gonna, not going to get into it because of time, but uh, Satan makes a statement that is not totally true. Eve responds, and because now she's talking to someone who has not threatened her, it's the first conversation that she's had other than with God or Adam. No other conversation has happened. The serpent is talking to her, questioning. It's sad, he says, that you're not able to eat of the trees of the garden. Well, the truth we know, God said, just the one in the middle. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of that tree, for the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. But in his conversation, he, he kind of sounds innocent. It's so sad that you can't eat the fruit of the trees. Oh, no. We can eat the fruit of all the trees. She did not identify in her response that God had said, yeah, that one you can't eat of. We can eat of the trees. See, it's innocent. So the conversation continues and he shows her how voluptuous and uh, appetizing it is and she reaches up, examines what he is showing and she had never taken time to look at it before because it's something that in God's relationship he said, we're not even going to go over there. You shouldn't be around that tree at all. You shouldn't even allow yourself to be tempted. Just stay away. All these other trees, you can eat all the fruit you want, but that tree, you cannot eat. Stay away from it. But there's where the Satan came, and he speaks from temptation. That which the Lord says, don't do that. How many know when you tell a child, now I've baked these cookies, and while it's been baking, they've been saying... Oh, that smells so good. Can I have one? No, you'll ruin your supper. Now, I don't want you eating any cookies. 
And mom gets busy. And here's the fragrance. And here's the memory. And I'm going to bake some cookies for later. And here's the fragrance. Oh, it smells so good. I just can't wait. And what? almost always they will go in and sneak a cookie. Now, mom innocently baked them to make a dessert that would be enjoyable. But therein is the asymptomatic. We don't realize that by nature we are tempted by things that are fragrant. Come on, ladies. Yay, nay. <laughs> Come on, men. I can remember multiple times getting smacked on my hand as a child coming in, as a teenager coming in, and if there was something cooking, I'd go over by the stove and just kind of look, and while Mom was looking, I'd try to grab something and just toss it and go in and get cleaned up. And she'd reach over, stop that. You can wait with the rest of us. Temptation. Asymptomatic. There's nothing wrong with that. When we look at what happened in the garden, we should have an understanding about what happens to us by nature. Our carnal nature is asymptomatic. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We were prone to be tempted. We were given the ability to choose good or evil. And yet the Lord says, don't go eat of that tree. In the wider circle of relationships in society and the church, all of us are vulnerable. Anyone who has someone that you talk to creates a vulnerability. As we look at this relationship with God, Adam and Eve, we read Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? See, that's not what God said. There was also a relationship that Adam had with Eve that began to play into the factor. Eve is what brought, uh, she brought the fruit to Adam. Therefore, before that, if Eve hadn't have been there, he wouldn't have had that connection of yielding to her to please her to, to go if he just kept his relationship with God and not spent more time with Eve. Maybe it wouldn't have developed. It's, it's just, how do we know what's going to cause us to fail? But we need to understand that everyone and every place and every hour of every day that we have an enemy, his intention is to deceive us and compromise us, that he can steal from us and eventually destroy our relationships and kill us. And he spends 24-7 trying to set us up. And it all looks innocent. Not only was the serpent the uninvited guest in the garden, but it, Lord, the, Lord said, the scripture says he was more crafty than any other of God's creation. Now, I, we don't have a record of every conversation, but I, I tend to think that God probably told Adam that the serpent over there that's walking over there, you watch out for him. Now, why would I say that when the Bible doesn't say it? I say that because God said, Adam, I want you to tend the garden, and I want you to guard it. So God was saying to Adam, you need to keep your eyes open because there is danger, potential danger, and it's your responsibility to not only care for the garden, but to guard it. And how many here to this morning if someone came and said, look out for their person, they are a thief. They are a liar. They are a manipulator. They are a user. Now, think about this. How many would 
if someone told you that, and you might say, well, it's according to who told me, but let's just say anybody told you, how many would say, well, I don't know if that's true. And you would think that in yourself, I'll make my own judgment. Just being honest, how many would say, I'll make my own judgment on that? See, there is the danger that Eve made her own judgment without the counsel of Adam and without waiting till God showed up to say, God, can you, can you refresh my memory? I remember we talked about this, but about that tree, this, this serpent over here that walks, and he's very crafty, and he just sounds like something isn't right. God, what do you think about that? See, Eve did what most of us do. We'll make our own evaluation of people. We'll make our own judgment, and we will not take the counsel even of God or a pastor, or a child would say, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. And mom and dad say, I don't want you going out with him. I don't want you spending time with him. And a child will say, I'll make up my own mind. Do you see what I'm saying? How many see this playing out in life? The enemy comes to us and he comes innocently and he makes us think that we really know more than anybody else, even people who've lived life and been through experiences, people who God have raised up and given anointing and, and given them wisdom for their responsibility. We tend to think, well, I'll just make up my own mind. I really don't have confidence in leadership. I, I just don't agree with the, what they're preaching, teaching, or I don't agree with my parents. I don't agree with my grandparents. I don't agree with the pastor. And it just, and it just goes on and on and on. And that's why I feel like God gave me this, is that I believe that we are being set up for a shootout on a regular basis. And the enemy is putting people in our, our path to constantly challenge us, to constantly twist the truth, to constantly make us question what we believe and what we read in the Bible. How many have said someone said something to you? Well, I read that in the Bible. You say, oh, I've never read that. Where's that at? How many have ever read, read the Bible passages numerous times and on a certain day at a certain time you're reading and the Lord, boom! And literally, I've got numerous versions of the Bible. I've got about a hundred different uh, texts and commentaries on my computer and I have literally gone back to my office at different times and went through and looked at everything I could look at because I just thought, that can't be in there. I've never seen that before. And there it was. And I look at Bibles that are far older than I am, and there it is. And I'm saying, how could I have not seen that? Because the Bible says the enemy has come to blind the eyes of our understanding. And the Spirit has come to open the eyes of our understanding. But the enemy is crafty and he's voluptuous and temptuous. He wants to really allure us. And the Holy Spirit is just here to speak kindly and softly. Please hear me. Don't do that. And yet the smell, the fragrance, the temptation is screaming at us. And because we don't remember that we're asymptomatic as people who were born in the flesh. We have a propensity to sin. We have a propensity to believe things that are not true. We have to be on our guard, church. Not only was the serpent uninvited guest that Adam should have been guarding against, he also asked an unnecessary question, which Eve got trapped in. Eve should have really chased the serpent out of the garden. She should have hollered for Adam, Adam, this crafty thing is here saying things that I don't think are good to listen to. Kick him out. Or maybe she should have just been so bold to say, God, where are you? You're watching over us. You said every day, this guy, he's causing trouble.
But our human propensity is to keep quiet and to allow ourselves to be duped. It's like kale. After we had hung up and uh, found out what was going on, the next day I called him back. I said, Kale, I want to reaffirm. I would never do that. Unless I talk to you personally, face to face, don't ever respond to anything that someone says, Pastor wants you to do this, or someone else said that the board wants you. No, 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 never, never. Just put that in your mind. Never, no, no. I wouldn't ask anybody. Ever. But you see, the heart in Kale, I want to help my pastor. His motivation for moving back from his homeland in Samoa was to come back and help me. He said, I felt bad that we'd moved away and, and I wasn't there to help you all these years. But I'm coming back to help you. And his heart was, boy, if pastor wants me to do that, Leah, go do this. <laughs> no. No. Cross the T and dot the I when it's something that affects your safety, your future, your finances, your marriage, your parenting, your, your relationship with God. Cross the T, dot the I, check it again. Seek godly counsel. Amen. Instead, Eve gave heed to the crafty servant, engaged in more conversation until she had finally done what he wanted her to do, was to take a bite. And yes, it was delicious. She turns and says, Adam, this is the most awesome fruit in all the garden. And Adam took it and ate it. Let me give you some examples. In the workplace, in church, anywhere. Someone may inquire of us why our face is downcast. Has that ever happened? You don't look like you feel good. You having a hard day? Something wrong? And then they will probe further into what's going on until they know personal things that they should not have known. And how many have seen the more they know about you, the more they feel like they're a part of you. And too often it creates a wedge in a relationship. I don't know that I have not seen a family in all my years of pastoring where someone from outside the family came in and either got close to the wife or the husband or the child and from that relationship created hurt and harm in the unity of the home. I can't say that I've ever seen a family that that has not happened. We are vulnerable to that. We are vulnerable in the workplace. Sometimes when a member of the church is confronted by the pastor, a fellow member every time will come and take their side and say, oh, I'm so sorry that he mistreated you and he talked to you that way and that this happened and I just, yeah, he's just a bad guy. Every time. It's not just once in a while. Every time. We have a propensity in our human nature to support one another when we feel like you're one of me and that person did that to you? How dare they? You see, this is what's happening in our nation with law enforcement. People who have an ulterior motive that is less than lossful want to get rid of the influence of the law, so they will do everything they can to make the law look at fault. 
and make you feel sorry for them. Because I'm just an American and they're taking away my freedoms and my liberties. <laughs> oh my goodness. And they are some of the most vile people that have ever walked the earth. But they have a propensity to play on your emotions and sympathies until they've got you standing with them at the cost of your reputation. Again, Good News Bible, the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to guard it. King James, to dress it and to keep it, so secure it. Two fundamental responsibilities that God gave the first man and woman on earth, he has also given to you and I. But when we look at the New Testament, God is now saying, clean your heart, your mind, and your soul. Clear the threshing floor. Dust out all the things that should not be there. And then guard your heart that none of those things come back. How many knew that that's what God said to Adam for the garden and our sustenance, our relationship, our livelihood, the very breath we breathe comes from God and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Lord says that we are to clean ourselves, wash our hands, wash our mind, wash our heart, amen? Clean it out, get rid of bitterness, get rid of anything that it does not belong there and put God upon the throne and then guard your heart that the enemy does not come in and deceive you and dethrone God and your affection for him. The Apostle Paul affirms that teaching that was in the Old Testament and is in the New Testament. Keep your heart with all diligence. Keep watch on your heart what's going on in your mind and in your soul with all diligence, Paul says. That's your first responsibility. Do not allow the world, the flesh, and the devil to get in and compromise you. Do not allow any other person, no matter who they are, family, friend, parishioner, pastor, congregant, whoever they are, president, law enforcement, or the most vile person in the society, do not allow them to come in and deceive you. It is so important that we become more cautious in our conversation. That we do not share intimate details with anyone but God and those that they pertain to. Amen, church. Because the enemy wants to use those things against you. If we're not watchful like Eve, these harmless, sim seemingly harmless conversations lead to confusion and even cause a breakdown in good relationships, good friendships, and they are the very root of over 65% of marriages ending in divorce. Because we didn't guard what we were thinking or saying who we were spending time with and who we were listening to. And it doesn't matter how good or how right it seems, if it is not blessed by God, the enemy is the one who's driving it and his end goal is to destroy you and everybody connected with you. Eve not only listened, but she began to hold a conversation. And that's where most people make a mistake. There are some things right on the onset we already know in our heart, this isn't right, we should run from evil. The Bible tells us run. Don't walk, don't just back away, run. 
Because if you once start holding the conversation with one as crafty as the enemy and anyone he's using, you're going to lose that battle. Doesn't matter who you are, I'll lose the battle. You cannot befriend the enemy. He's craftier than you are. And without the Holy Spirit on the throne of your heart and guarding you and helping you stay strong, you're going to fall. Please listen to this. You can believe, no, I'm going to make my own mind up. I'll choose my own friends. I'm not going to let anybody influence me. If you can see someone is not doing what the Bible says, the Bible says you should not be a friend to them. You can pray for them. You can witness to them. But you cannot be a friend to them. And you should not be fellowshipping and going to their home. Now, that's not pastor's teaching. That's not my opinion. That's God's. It's kind of like the Lord saying, don't eat of that tree in the middle of the garden because you're going to find out things that you don't want to know and it will destroy our relationship. We must understand that Satan is God's enemy, enemy, but he is also our enemy. He is obsessed with the disease of pride. He still believes he's going to ascend to the throne of God and take the throne from him. Still believes that. He's full of sin. He's crafty in all his ways. The word of God refers to Satan as a thief who comes to steal from us, to kill us and to destroy. There are many, 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 the Bible says, that use the Lord's name and in the Lord's name do what they do. But the Bible says that in eternity, God will judge them and they will say, Lord, Lord, look what I have done in your name. And the Lord's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You never had a spiritual relationship with me. You use my name for your advantage. There are preachers that hold positions in pulpit and in ministry that have multitudes following them that are not called of God. They're self-called, and they are so effective in swooning the people to the degree that when God comes, they won't be ready. They're following a smoozer. Proverbs 26, 20, and 21, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, quarreling stops. Charcoal keeps embers glowing. Wood keeps fires burning. And troublemakers keep arguments alive. They will not let it alone. Will not commit it to prayer and be silent. They are instruments of Satan stirring up the coals and keeping the fires of destruction burning. You know that since... Lucifer in the Garden of Eden did what he did to Eve. He has not relented. He has come to every human being that's ever been born into the billions of billions of people, and he has affected every one of us from the beginning of the Garden. Is that scary to know that he has that much ability and power? If you notice, the reply that Eve gave to the serpent, she added a little bit and said, you must not touch it. God didn't say that. He said, just don't eat it. God instructed them not to eat of the fruit, but Eve supplemented. She she immediately had bought into Satan what he was doing when he first said his first statement. Hath not God said... You cannot eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. He began the lie, and now Eve, just in three-sentence conversation, has bought in humanly to twisting the truth. How many see that that happens? How many have had that happen in your own life? I've had that. And I've had to go back and stop myself and say, excuse me, what I just said was not accurate. Here's the... Here's the truth. Because the enemy will come in while you're trying to talk and put a seed in your mind. And if you're not careful, you will say it without judging it. That's why the Lord says, 
Now it's your responsibility to guard the thoughts of your mind and the intents and motives of your heart. To guard it. Now I know that this is not exciting. And it's not shouting glory, hallelujah, and we're, we're getting ready. But folks, I'm talking to you about something that has brought down every generation in the history of mankind. And the Bible's telling us if we're not careful, the trumpet's going to sound and we will have been deceived and not ready. Matthew 25, quickly, the kingdom of heaven, parable of ten virgins. It says the kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins, took their lamps, went to meet the bridegroom, five of them foolish, five wise. Uh, The foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. The wise took flask of oil with their lamps. The bridegroom was delayed and they became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, here comes the bridegroom. And the five foolish that did not come with extra oil were out trying to find it. And the bridegroom came at midnight. See the significance of what I'm talking about? Mark chapter 13, the Bible says in 1332, no one concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. This is verse 33 of Matthew or of Mark 13. Be on guard. Stay alert, for you do not know when the time will come. Now, we know when noon is, 12 o'clock. We know when midnight is, 12 o'clock at night. But the Bible's telling us something here. You need to be on guard and stay alert because you don't know which hour of the day the enemy is going to come for you and tempt you and you're going to fall, and you don't know if that's going to be the same hour that God's going to come with his angels of glory to gather up his bride and take the church. How awful would that be to be totally ready and on the very moment that Jesus comes to have slipped and gave yourself away for something that had an eternal consequence. That's why the Lord says you have to be on guard and stay alert every moment of every day, even through the night. Do not allow the enemy any advantage in your life or in your home. At the midnight hour in Acts chapter 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped. How many would say... If you were in that situation, your first thought humanly, the earthquake has broken the doors. Run! I have some carnal still in me. That'd probably be my first thought. Run for your life! They're probably going to execute you tomorrow. They've stoned you. They've got you here in stocks and bonds. You're going to die. The Lord shook the gates open. That'd be my first thought, and the devil would probably be right behind it saying, the Lord caused this earthquake, and those doors are open. Run, Bob, run. I'd say, yay! Another day to preach. But that's not God's perspective. Do you know, we read the rest of the story and what happened as a result of Paul and Silas staying there. The jailer and his family were saved. It didn't get them out of trouble. They still went before the court. They still faced the consequences. They were still prisoners. They weren't set free. But the jailer in his house was saved. Now then he's going to say, 
do what's best for you. But if you're a child of God, you have to listen to the Holy Spirit because if, he, if you're there, you're there on a mission. Because you're never without God. Never without God. Never without God. If you're a servant of the Lord, you're never where he cannot be. <laughs> Nothing is too hard for God. If you're in jail, God has a hand in what's happening and he has a hand in what's going to happen. Keep your sense about you spiritually. You remember the story of Elijah? Elijah in 1 Kings 18, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? He's talking to the people of Israel. They've been taken over by heathen nations and there's 400 prophets of Ashereth and 450 prophets of Baal and they've been trying to get their God to come down and consume this sacrifice so that they'd know who to follow. Elijah says to the people, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? Is the Lord God? Then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And the people would not even answer. One prophet, and most people think it was just 450 prophets of Baal, but there was 850 prophets, 400 of Ashereth and 400 of Baal, 50 of Baal, and they were all against Elijah by himself. He prays, God answers, burns up the fire, and the Lord takes care of the rest. It was a confrontation, a high noon spiritual moment, and God came through. Just him and his servant. And we're going to read this and I'm going to be done. Isaiah 59, first nine verses, something important for you to look at when you have convenience. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speak lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. One is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and the acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush to sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their path. They have turned themselves into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. That passage is a prophetic passage of the very hour that we're living in. Look at what's happening to our world. It's not just America. But let me submit this to you. Should America fall and turn into the chaos to get to do, there will be no hope for anywhere in the world. The pillagers will do what they want to do and there'll be nobody to stop them. But the Bible says something important. Judgment begins at the house of God because God is going to look to his people, always has, but especially in the last days, he's going to look to his people to ask you a question. What are you going to do? Last Sunday's question. What are you going to do? In the midst of what's happening, where are you going to stand? Where's your heart? To survive what's going to happen, will you be able to give up your faith and turn away from what you know is right? To have a few more days, months, years, even if that long as Jesus tears, which I just don't see that, 
I just think things are happening so quick that we're, we're headed to, to uh, a, a calamity that will be amazing. But as we started the service this morning, I remind you that nothing is too hard for God. And if we keep our mind on the Lord and our heart toward Him and do not allow anything, anyone, or any group of people or anything that's happening in the world come between us and God, God will keep us. Amen. He will shelter us. He will cover us. He will uphold us and undergird us. He will see us through. Doesn't mean we won't see it or feel it or be a part of what's happening. It just means it will not destroy us and can't separate us from God. How many are determined to keep in a relationship with the Lord? The old chorus says, and we're going to pray, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm not going to turn back. Get with your family this week and say, I just need to talk to you face to face, eye to eye. If they're too far away and you can't get to where they are, get them on the phone and say, sit down and I want you to pay attention to what I'm asking you. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And is there anything in your life that could separate you from God's love and forgiveness and mercy? because we need to be ready. 12 o'clock is coming. And after that, it'll be too late. How many hear what pastor's saying? How many have a sense of that already in your spirit? Our days are numbered and counting down. We need to be ready for the coming of Jesus. So would you tend your garden, check your heart, your mind, your relationships, your involvements? If the Lord can get your attention and say, you need to let that go, you need to separate yourself from that because it's getting close. You don't want to have that deception, that, that weakness, that influence shouldn't be there. Are you decided? How many here this morning you're not sure whether you're going to serve God or the world or the flesh or Baal or somebody else? Make sure. Make sure. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided.
before you leave, remember your responsibility that God spoke to Adam and he spoke to every human being through the scripture Old and New Testament. Clean your heart. Clean your mind. Repent of any sin. Break off all relationships that are not of God. And then guard your heart that no root of bitterness, no envy, no lust, no pride of life, nothing could get in and become between you and God. Just take a moment. Take inventory and say, Holy Spirit of heaven, would you speak to us this morning if there is anything, mind, body, soul, or spirit, past, present, or future, Lord, that I have not surrendered to you, I have not confessed, I have not brought before you and sought your counsel. Lord, would you show it and reveal it to us this hour, throughout this day. Help us, Lord, to take inventory. Help us, Lord, to take responsibility of cleaning out anything that does not belong in our thinking, in our feeling, and in our living. Oh, Lord, help us to be consecrated and sold out to you that we are ready for the soon return of your son, Jesus. Spirit of heaven, would you help us? Help us, Lord, be diligent with all diligence to guard our heart, our mind, our soul, and our body, that you would keep us from evil, keep us from compromise, keep us from being deceived, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. No, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Would you sing that with me today? God bless you. Thank you for being here. Stay loving God and following the Lord. Amen. No, I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I am not afraid. Yes. Awesome.